Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you join us from. Uh, this is your monthly Afra Sky Connect dialogue. And uh, today, my guest of Lamic Airlines, Mr. Joao Carlos Po George. So in today's discussion, we are going to review the state of the industry, uh, particularly the situation uh, within uh, the uh, Mozambican domestic market. We're going to look at some of the industry challenges and how we plan to address them from the perspective of the CEO of uh, LAM Mozambique Airlines. We're then going to also look at um, airline cooperation in Africa. How do we progress? How do we make it a reality? Then we look at market access and connectivity with specific reference to the Saturn implementation and the Africa continental free trade area as well as the free movement of people and goods. We would then uh, finally touch on the legacy of Mr. Joao as the executive committee chair and also as the other chairman. So we, we would look at this. So he's not only the chief executive of LAM Mozambique Airlines, but in addition to that, he also leads the AFRA Executive Committee, you can call it the AFRA Board of Directors, as well as the Airlines Association of Southern Africa Board of Directors. So we would be reviewing a number of things. Ladies and gentlemen, relax and join us as we do this discussion. Remember, you can participate in the discussion by either logging on and putting your comments in the Q&A tab, your questions on the Q&A tab, or in the chat box. Let us make this another lively session of Afra Sky Connect. And at the end of it all, I am sure that our guest will give us some really fantastic and memorable takeaways that can help enhance our African aviation sector and possibly you might pick a queue or two that can improve your own operations or business. This is why we do this. And uh, we look forward to your active participation as we go ahead uh, in today's discussion. As in previous session, our third time today would be exactly one hour, starting from now till uh, an hour from now. And, um, our the guest will be taking us through a number of um, subject areas. Ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you are muted if you are not uh, contributing to the discussions. And uh, if you do have a point, please just put it in the chat box so that we can have a formalized and structured way of dealing with your um, questions and, and the comments. Thank you again, and uh, on behalf of everyone and on behalf of the AFRA Secretariat, may I welcome our guest to today's show, Mr. Joao. <laughs> Good day and welcome to AFRA Sky Connect. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you for that nice introduction. Uh... Thank you. So uh, in today's discussion, uh, we would just start off briefly by uh, you, if you can do us a favor by introducing yourself briefly, your background, and also um, LAM Mozambique Airlines, um, probably for the benefit of those who probably do not know you and probably would not know where LAM Mozambique Airlines is based and what business it's involved in. Thank you. Hello, did you get my question, please? Sorry, I, I'm, I lost you for a few seconds there. I, I'm back again. Okay, great, thank you. Now, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, for the sake of some of our guests who probably might not know you, uh, if you could spend a few seconds to give us a brief introduction of yourself and LAM Mozambique Airlines. 
Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, yeah, a few seconds, starting in 1983, that's when I joined the aviation uh, in LAM, assembling APUs, and I think the disease got onto me. So I never, you know, uh, left this uh, passion. Um, I then uh, restructured the engineering department at the airline, spent a few years in Seattle uh, as an airline representative assembling or witnessing the assembly of airplanes. And then in 95, I joined United Technologies. Pratt Whitney, I was in Zimbabwe, then Senegal, and then the last 10 years in Ethiopian Airlines, at Ethiopian Airlines, supporting uh, uh, the operation uh, in uh, African countries. Um, I came back to the airline as COO uh, around 2014. Uh, and then I uh, took over as a CEO in 2018. Um, I mean, my, my work with AFRA has been since 86. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've always appreciated the initiative of this uh, organization, I should say that, and supported it. And uh, we'll talk uh, about some issues and subjects that uh, AFRA is, uh, is uh, putting together to, to make aviation a success in Africa. And in terms of the airlines, um, uh, Mozambique Airlines has been in the market for nearly 80 years. Uh, and uh, it has been an airline that served the, re essentially the regional uh, markets, but we've done uh, intercontinental uh, between the years of uh, 83 and 90, 94, 95. Uh, but now we are essentially an airline of, uh, uh, you know, eight, nine airplanes, actually. Uh, we've just got an additional um, Q400. We're getting, uh, we're expanding this year with two more Q400s and probably a 737 um, uh, to, to make sure we cover uh, the routes, the additional frequencies and, and also cover the region, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We want to do most of uh, uh, East and Southern Africa. Um, so uh, uh, the airline has got mainly uh, Mozambican uh, people, skilled people, and uh, we are about 750 now. And, uh, you know, of course, with the industry. Um, so this is it about me and the airline. Okay. The, the airline has been around for 80 years. That must be one of Africa's oldest existing airlines. I How guess so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this airline started serving, of course, with the relationship we had with the colonizers, you know, and it started uh, at that time and uh, it continued. Mozambique is a very vast country and right there and then it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, essential to have air transportation uh, because of the difficulties we have, uh, and namely with flooding and uh, road conditions, uh, air transportation is, is essential. It's very important for the, the social, secu uh, for security, for safety uh, around the country and the economy. Yeah, but and, and, and for uh, Mozambique, as you said, is a vast country um, with quite a difficult um, terrain to navigate, particularly by a rail, road or rail. And those infrastructures are also not exactly well developed. So air transport must have played a very significant role in uh, connecting the country together and linking the country to the outside world. Did, did you get me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the airline must have been very critical in linking the country together and connecting Mozambique to the rest of the world over these years? Yes, very much so, essential. I mean, uh, we've seen that, for example, during COVID, where it was so important to uh, keep mobility within the country. And during the floods and uh, the cyclones, we just experienced one, two or three days ago, which is basically blocking the country uh, from a uh, ground uh, uh, road movement. Wow. Yeah, I mean, my, my very, very sorry uh, about the recent uh, cyclone that hit parts of uh, Mozambique. Um, we wish that uh, the government and authorities will speedily recover this and bring some relief uh, to its citizens. But having said that, you mentioned uh, COVID and uh, COVID really impacted the industry very, very badly. And uh, to a greater extent, many of the airlines 
across the continent really suffered a huge setback from the progress we were seeing making. How did COVID really there Mozambique Airlines? Well, COVID was, of course, uh, you know, terrible for uh, for every country, and uh, you know, in Mozambique, for the society was. Uh, was very difficult because we depend a lot on international traffic, tourism, um, and and import and export. So it uh, you know impacted like every other economy. But for for the airline, uh, it was uh, um, interesting in a way. First of all, I must say the staff <laughs> may, kept full um, availability commitment to make sure that air transportation was there. Uh, the government made it clear to us that we needed to keep operations. Uh, we reduced, of course, a lot in terms of frequencies, but we never stopped service, serving uh, domestic destinations. And where we could, we would go to destinations like uh, Dar es Salaam, Johannesburg, when it was open, because we depended on, on that as well to keep the economy and the health services running. Um, so uh, COVID was was tough on us. You know, we we, we lost eighty percent of our traffic, but uh, it pushed us to you know to or it tested our resilience in order to keep us flying full fledged. And when COVID was relaxed, uh, the, the rules were relaxed. We were able to immediately pick up and get uh, back on track. Uh, and now, since about a year ago, we are back on the pre-COVID numbers. Um, but yeah, COVID put a lot of challenges on us, but taught us a lot of lessons, uh, you know, where we'd have to become more lean, more mean, and, um, and uh, definitely we understood uh, a lot of the, the processes and, their, and, and the efficiencies that we could introduce. And we also understood that, you know, the staff uh, commitment and the staff availability and dedication is extremely important for our, for our operations in an airline like uh, ours. I, I am happy you are emphasizing the role the staff played during the lockdown to ensure that the uh, LAM continues in operations and continue to serve the markets that it needed to. I mean, in, in many airlines, the role of staff is taken for granted, but I'm happy that you are actually uh, highlighting that as one of the key sustainability elements during the COVID period and that has seen you through. But currently, where are you with recovery? You said the numbers are back. Are they your routes also back? Have you re resumed on all your routes um, up to the capacity you were operating before? Yes, we have reestablished all the routes except for Nairobi and that's due to equipment, not uh, for the market. Uh, uh, we have re we have restarted uh, Harare, which we were not operating before COVID, and we want to you know look at other opportunities, including Nairobi, but Lilongwe, Lusaka, Vic Falls, and uh, uh, other tourism destinations in South Africa. Uh, the numbers are back. The numbers are back. Uh, uh, revenue is 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 has exceeded uh, the pre-COVID revenue. That's that's encouraging. And and and, and what is your outlook for the future? What, are, what do you see 2023, 2024, 2025? How is it going to be like in terms of traffic and operations? Yeah, we, we are definitely forecasting um, a significant growth for 23. Uh, and the good thing is it's mostly corporate. So there's more business going on. There is more spread along the country. Uh, of course, we have the oil and gas projects, projects coming back now and some major tourism developments. Uh, the government is starting a program to increase uh, you know, conference facilities in the country, calling more uh, you know, non-usual uh, non visitors to the country. So we, we can see a very good potential for growth there for us. And also in the cargo uh, uh, operations, we'll see uh, it's something we don't have. We don't have dedicated cargo. We do some charters with cargo, but we want to look into that uh, starting in 23. And of course, 24 will be a consolidation year for us. And, and um, for 2023, do you um, anticipate any difficulties? Any challenges? Well, well, we are concerned in 23 with, uh, with some costs of... Uh, uh, handling costs of uh, foreign operator permits uh, between countries. We need to really do some good work in order to stimulate that. 
uh, we we also are are watching carefully the price of fuel. We don't know what's going to happen, and that will be a big challenge for us in case that's affected. Uh, you know, of course, uh, we hope that uh, the skies get uh, get free. Uh, you know that we can move uh, easily, uh, and that we we sit with other other carriers in Africa for cooperation, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more in detail further down. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, as 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 we move um, along, there's the issue you mentioned about fuel uh, price, which is actually quite volatile um, around the world, and in particularly in Africa, uh, the cost of fuel is on average about thirty five percent more expensive than it is elsewhere. Now, uh, how is that likely to impact on operations and and the bottom line of airlines? Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Can you repeat that question? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the high cost of fuel. And I'm saying that fuel prices are generally much higher in Africa than in the rest of the world by about 35%. And this tends to impact operations of African airlines significantly and their profitability. Uh, do you do you see that um, in 2023 we likely to see some stability in the fuel prices, or the volatility is likely to continue? Yeah, our our prediction or our uh, we are preparing for volatility. We we don't know what's going to happen, you know, with the situation in the world with the peace and uh, availability of fuel. Uh, we see a lot of that. We see some uh, destinations with shortage of fuel, which was not happening in the past. Uh, that needs to be addressed because that forces us to tanker and of course reduce payloads and the cost of tankering itself. So unfortunately, we don't see the same stability you see in the rest of the world uh, in terms of uh, fuel supply, both in price and uh, free availability. Yeah, talk, talking about um, high cost, I think fuel is just one of one of the elements that actually affect airline operations adversely. Um, we also have the issue of taxes, charges, and fees uh, that are impacting the industry. I don't know about your markets and the markets you operate to in 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 East Southern Africa. Do you have the issue situation of high cost of taxes and charges as well? Yeah, definitely. We we are when we are looking into opening new routes, especially across the border, uh, we we face sometimes with uh, with extremely high, unreasonably high, if I may say that, uh, costs of uh, foreign operator permits. Uh, handling is an issue in some uh, destinations. Uh, the handling costs are very high, uh, and yeah, like you said, other taxes. Uh, you know. Uh, for many for many reasons evoked are are I unreasonable and sometimes I don't know if they should exist. I don't think, for example, airports uh, in Africa should uh, be sustainable only from uh, revenues uh, from operators and passengers. Uh, they need to diversify and uh, you know and probably assume some of the costs of running uh, and not pass them all to the operator in the future in order to develop. Uh, uh, the the aviation market in Africa within Africa. That is interesting. Um, they, they, when you talk to the airports, they often say that look, they have um, tried to get onto non aeronautical revenues by um, charging for parking and uh, by providing other supplementary services at the airports to make up. But these revenues are just not enough to cover their costs. So hence the need for them to charge higher um, to actually make up for the cost of services. Now, the other argument that has always been advanced by airports is that the, their charges are also based on the volumes. And uh, for many of the African airports, the volumes are low. Either airline frequencies are low or the number of passengers that are dropped and picked are also low. So they have, and since they have a, a huge fixed cost to cover, they actually need to charge high to be able to do this. But 
are there situations where airlines and airport do a cost benefit analysis to see whether the airports are actually, what they are charging, whether they are delivering value for money? Yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, that uh, there should be a cost benefit analysis, but, you know, we, we need to bear in mind that building an airport uh, with a three or four kilometer runway is like building a thousand kilometer uh, highway. And uh, that should be an in for infrastructure uh, in order to promote the traffic. You know, what's happening now is if you, and like you rightfully said, uh, expect to pay the costs of building and maintaining an airport with a uh, few frequencies because, you know, between two destinations, being it, say, um, um, Baira and Lusaka uh, uh, is going to pay, it's not going to work. The costs will be very high. The passengers, you know, will fly because they have to. Uh, there will be no VFR, uh, no tourism between those two destinations. So we need to use uh, the the dropping costs in order to promote traffic, uh, like I said, within Africa. Mm. Uh, and and uh, earlier on talked about uh, staff. I want to get back into uh, the issue of um, the growth that you are anticipating for this year and beyond, as against the skills, uh, skills, human resource that you have, or you anticipate. Do you think? within Mozambique, you would be able to have the necessary skilled resources to meet your growing needs as we go along? No, it's a, it's a two-line uh, answer for the question. I mean, we will need to hire some trained, experienced skills in order to introduce some uh, new equipment, in order to expand at the speed we want. We are doing already so by going uh, luckily, we can go to countries in the neighborhood uh, to get uh, uh, experienced pilots and some mechanics. But we, the biggest challenge is to, challenge is to train low nationals in order to take over. Um, the good thing is we have a lot of uh, raw material for that exercise. We have a lot of very uh, willing, very available, you know, um, highly motivated uh, 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 youth that can be trained and we need to invest on training. We, uh, I believe, so by the way, 2023 is going to be in, in my personal uh, commitment, the year that I want to dedicate to training. And, and I'm very glad to see AFRA and other organizations making some training available, not only uh, management, uh, sorry, uh, pilots and mechanics, but also management and uh, other skills in the aviation industry. I, I believe that we need to dedicate much time on that. Yeah, it, indeed, we, we need uh, to, to uh, um, bring in as much more capacity as possible to support this. But does Mozambique suffer um, brain drain as a result of skills moving to other markets, other countries? Uh, not, not really, not significantly. I mean, there is a few and sometimes they are key people, but uh, not, not significantly, uh, you know, like we've seen in the past with some organizations, uh, it's, uh, it's not. But it is a concern that, you know, it will happen, it can happen, and, uh, and we need to be prepared for that and let them go, you know, while we are tra training other people to take over. Yeah. Uh, now, on, on building capacity, uh, you said 2023 would be um, your focus on developing capacity on the very enthusiastic youth that you have in the country for this industry. Um, uh, just, just for your information, and, and I'm sure you know this, that um, AFRA can partner with yourselves um, to broaden the scope of skills uh, training that you can bring to bear. And uh, I think that it is an opportunity uh, for us to probably work together on seeing how we can develop a roadmap towards building uh, capacity uh, in different areas to, to meet the, the shortfall. Oftentimes, as you highlighted, when we talk about um, capacity building, the focus is always on the technical side, the operations and technical side. But I think managerial capacity is critical if our airlines are going to be sustainable and it's important that we as much as possible try and engage 
in developing that aspect um, of our human resource as well. But in addition to the, the, the skills shortage uh, that and, and the development opportunities that we are looking at at this point in time. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, about the need for um, diversifying this. What is the involvement of women in aviation in Mozambique? Well, uh, we still have like a 40-60 women to men ratio, uh, but we have in some key operational positions, you know, like station managers is an area where I already found and I've, I've made a point of keeping it that way, a, a, a bigger proportion of women there. Uh, so it's to say that there is no stop uh, of uh, stoppage of doing that. We, we have hired some pilots, not enough, and on the training programs we have now, we want to stimulate uh, and encourage uh, uh, women to, to join the, the training programs in order to do that. We've signed the IATA commitment of 25-25, um, uh, which, is, which is a good one. And, uh, you know, I'm sure all as, as executives, we want to make sure we promote that uh, in order to level the playing field. Mm. Oh great! I, I didn't know you were you were you are onboarded on uh, twenty five by twenty twenty five. That is actually yes, a very yes. great initiative, and I'm thank yes, you for patience for that. Yeah, it I is, show the you. commitment of this industry to really bring up as many women as possible into uh, this aviation sector. I remember many years ago, a, a very a senior aviation professional once said that. You know, when you train uh, many women in the aviation industry, you tend to create more stability than if you have many men trained in the industry. Uh, <laughs> I agree. And, and his argument was simple, that the men, they, they can just get up any day and decide, no, no, I'm moving to a different country, I'm moving to a different um, um, airline somewhere else. But for the women, they have a lot of considerations to make if they have to move. So women in aviation tend to be more stable than the men in aviation. And I, and I think it is, it's very true. If you look in many of the airlines, some of the oldest staff are normally uh, the, the, the female staff because they don't, they're not enthused because they have other social responsibilities such as their families, and the social network, so they don't want to move away from, which is which is very interesting. And I think <laughs> the more we involve women in aviation, the better and well-grounded aviation in Africa will be. And, and that is my view in support of uh, women in aviation. I'm sure there will be women who would actually add on to what I'm just saying. But <laughs> enough of that for now. C can we look at um, blocked funds? Uh, has um, LAM got um, uh, some funds blocked in some countries that is unable to get out? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have for a long time, we have uh, in one country blocked funds and we, we've been fighting for that. Uh, you know, again, IAT has, done, has helped us a little bit. Uh, of course, we, we try to manage now by using those funds in operations uh, to that desti the destination. But yeah, we are, we're still hoping that one of these days we'll be able to uh, get those funds available for, uh, for us to return back to country. Uh, it, it, now, it, it, we have, of course, the ways to avoid uh, increasing the, the, the amount that's blocked. Uh, but yeah, it's not nice. Uh, it blocks your abil ability to sell. And it would be very good if we could sort that out. Yeah, it is, it's actually uh, very frustrating um, because... Around around the, the world, there's about 1.6 billion of blocked funds, out of which 1 billion is in Africa. And, and, and I'm sure with uh, what is happening now post-COVID with many economies and the strain for foreign currency, this number might be on its way up. I haven't seen the latest mm -hmm. figures. And everything needs to be done as much as possible to ensure that airlines get money to continue to support their operations into various markets. In fact, AFRA has, uh, is also working on, um, with, in partnership with IATA to try and address the issue of block funds. 
And uh, one of our initiatives is uh, reaching out to our member airlines to know in which locations they have blocked funds to enable us trigger an advocacy action. So we would be reaching out to you to get um, some more details and uh, so that we can be able to see how best we can uh, intervene uh, to sure, provide sure. some support. Now, on, on the, the other front, African Airlines needs to be sustainable. And um, uh, by sustainability, I don't just mean environmental sustainability, but I mean economic sustainability as well. And, and over the years, collectively, African Airlines have not been profitable. We need to break this trend, especially as we get getting out of post-COVID in the leaner, meaner operations. Uh, all efforts are towards ensuring that we operate much more profitably uh, going into the future. Now, I don't know from your perspective, what do you think African Airlines should be doing to one, reduce their costs, and two, improve their operations and their margins so that they move into profitability zone. Mm. Yeah, look, uh, um, I mean, it's probably a little bit of a political question too. I, I, I would start by saying that we, we need to be very transparent, very ethical. I mean, I don't want to go into words, you know, uh, that sound bad, but uh, we need to have this kind of transparency, honesty, you know, and make sure that we're using the resources of a shareholder, being it the state or a private shareholder or, or the public. Um, so that's the, the essential, I think, uh, modus operandi of the airline. Then, of course, let the airlines run professionally and, uh, you know, of course, with accountability, uh, but do not interfere you know in a different way other than setting policy uh, setting rules and regulations for you know financial operation reporting etc but i think the main thing is be honest be dedicated you know and make sure you're there to do a, a, a job a good job safe safety first and then economics follows immediately after uh, what what i would say is that you know if you look into revenue drainage uh, into your your non required costs or or fat you know that you need to shave you you will definitely achieve a stability you know it's not a big profit operation but at least you'll pay your bills that's what we've done covid was in the middle but from 2018 to 2022 we have been able to change from a loss operational loss situation to a level uh, uh, operation. We are paying our bills in full since about a year ago. So I, I believe it's possible. All we need is the market and like I said, good management. Great. I, I, I'm so glad you, you touched on the issues of transparency and ethics in the operations as well as also professionalism in the running of the business. Whilst the shareholder or, 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 or government pay off and allow the business to run as a business. And, and that is what you are doing. Um, and the results are showing for themselves. You know, I, I have always been of the view that in Africa, airlines are not necessarily polit uh, profitability tools or businesses. They, are, they also play a critical role in connectivity. And the connectivity mm -hmm. comes with a lot of socioeconomic benefits in the absence of air transport, citizens of the countries would suffer. So we, we look at if an airline can break even, in my view, that is good enough. If it can make profit, it's excellent. But the social aspect of the business that airlines have to perform in Africa is also critical in linking our people together and moving goods and services to places that otherwise might be very difficult uh, to do so. But there's also the aspect of the environmental sustainability that is gaining momentum all over the, the world, um, including Africa. And um, the ICAO Corsia has been adopted. I don't know whether um, Mozambique is one of the countries that has actually 
enrolled on the uh, voluntary phase. Um, but in addition to that, we also saw both IATA and IKO uh, adopt different resolution or same resolution on the net zero emission by 2025, calling on our stakeholders to work together to ensure that we have a very streamlined and uh, less polluting aviation industry uh, by 2025. First is Mozambique rolled on the Corsia program at this phase between now and 2026, which is the voluntary phase. I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely, yes, uh, our civil aviation is reporting and we, we are reporting to them on the Corsia. <clears throat> Uh, and then we also, uh, you know, have, have taken note, 2050, right? That zero emissions, uh, 25 yes. is when the program will start. That's one of the concerns I have. You see, in Africa, we have a, a kind of a conflict where we're saying we want to increase travel, air travel, and at the same time, we want to decrease the emissions. So it, it is a, a bigger challenge than for other uh, regions in the world. Um, so I am. Uh, this is a concern to me, but I fully agree. We need to be more environmental friendly. You know, planning of aircraft, the, the adequate sizes. As the traffic grows, we grow, but don't exceed. You know, don't offer extra capacity that's not needed. That's very important. So planning, cooperation. You know, we can cooperate between states or between airlines uh, in within the continent. So that in, in, uh, increases efficiency of usage of capacity and does reduction of uh, fuel consumption. But I also think there's an area where we need to look into, which is the removal of the, the plastics and other pollutants that we produce so much in the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so, so what, what I would say is that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have the big challenge both on the fuel burn, on the carbon footprint, and also on the uh, pollution that we cause. And we need to want to change that uh, immediately and dramatically. Hmm. Now, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Now, it's interesting you brought in the issue of uh, the, the pollution that we create. I mean, I know some airlines already have well, programs in place on how they, they deal with the waste that is generated, particularly in flight, uh, because most of the uh, cutlery, uh, the, the cutlery, the, the plates, and and the the pep bottles that are used inside are actually plastics and very difficult to decompose. Um, has LAM got a plan like that, or are you working on something um, to properly dispose of your plastic waste? Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. That's exactly what I wanted to get. We are going in that direction. Uh, we want to eliminate plastics, uh, you know, cutlery, wraps. Uh, uh, unfortunately, plastic is extremely convenient, and, and, and but I think it's still in our minds. You know, I, I never post anything in social media, but one day I asked a question, how can I take this plastic from my sandwich? And people gave me many su suggestions of paper, of uh, other alternatives. And I think the, the first thing we, we need is to want to do it. We need to, to be committed, you know, to understand that our next generation cannot live with that. So we need to move in that direction. But to, an, to answer your question, yes, we have started a plan with our catering suppliers in order to reduce as much as possible the use of uh, single-use plastics. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, now on um, sustainable aviation fuels, you know, this is one area that uh, the, it is believed that Africa has a huge potential to get into the production of the feedstock that can be used in uh, production of uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, I don't know whether there have been any initiatives within your country uh, to produce um, sap or, or, or bio, bio uh, stock for sap production? Yeah, that is uh, our very, very big concern. You know, the, the industry here is not big enough to produce saps locally. We've already been told that. We have approached some suppliers and we have been told that. We have actually been suggested that we could pay for the price of saf 
but burn the normal fuel and you take some credit for that. And that's not what we want. You know, we really want to burn fuels that are non-carbon uh, printable. So, so we, we know that it's going to be a big challenge. The, the volumes in some of the, or most of the African destinations are not big enough to justify a set, a setting up a new infrastructure separate from the current fuels or converting this one. So we are seeing prices that can go 2.5 to three, three times the price of current fuels. And that's against what we want. We want to bring the price down of, uh, of trans air transportation. So yes, we've done some work. We've spoken to many of the, the suppliers that we use and uh, uh, the future doesn't look uh, great. Uh, I think that the alternatives that the manufacturers have will be to reduce to, to bring it lower, but not to eliminate completely by newer aircraft, bigger wings. And again, it's an area where we are not going there. We are, we're still flying airplanes that are eight, 10, 12 years old. And that's going to be a very big challenge for us. And, and I hope we, we find a solution for that. Well, thank, thank, thank you for, for that uh, response and, and uh, being very objective on that issue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you can participate in the ongoing discussion by posting your questions or comments in the Q&A tab or the chat box. Please feel free to make it as interactive as possible. I look forward to your questions um, that our guests uh, can assist us in clarifying at the appropriate time, our time permitting. Now, I want to move on to another subject, and, and this one is um, African Airlines Cooperation and Collaboration. This seems to be a global trend, and there have been so much successes about airlines that have collaborated or cooperated, uh, but in Africa, it's such a difficult thing. Why is it difficult for African airlines to work together? Hello, hello, sorry, you breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just saying that um, cooperation and collaboration uh -huh. among airlines globally has yielded great successes for many operators. But in Africa, it's difficult for airlines to cooperate. Why is that? Okay, I, I have a view that, you know, in order to cooperate, you need to have, of course, some common interests. And usually and commonly, that interest is to expand your network. So, you know, it makes sense that, uh, uh, you know, if you have a, a flights between, uh, say, Joburg and, and Bayer, then, uh, a South African operator can do that uh, together with the Mozambican operator or under SATAM, you know, another, a third operator can do. And then the, the, the cooperation is to expand from those that two, two points of, uh, of the flight. Uh, so, and I think our markets in most uh, areas do not uh, offer enough need for that to happen until, of course, we promote this inter-Africa markets and I can see Mozambique has just opened recently uh, the borders to uh, e-visas, uh, visas uh, within African countries, also visas within uh, between Africa and uh, other countries in the world. Uh, so I, I believe that this is the, the must for the need to be there for to cover regions, wide regions. Africa is a very wide region. Uh, I mean to go from um, uh, I won't say even Maputo, Joburg to Morocco, you fly via Paris, uh, and that shouldn't be the case, you know. So I, I, I see cooperation will happen. It will happen when the markets are established. And uh, for airlines, there's all need and all interest. I mean, we would like to start flying to hubs like Nairobi. We fly to, <coughs> excuse me, Dar es Salaam as a hub already, uh, and, but you'll fly to Nairobi. We want to fly to Addis. And of course, Johannesburg is one of our main hubs. And I, I, I believe cooperation will be essential. SATAM will facilitate, will promote, will stimulate that cooperation to happen because then suddenly you can extend your network beyond what you normally can do with the current restrictions on traffic rights and the bilateral agreements, et cetera. 
Yes, but what we've noticed is that even on uh, today's operation, we don't we see very limited cooperation on the routes that African airlines are both. If you have two or more African airlines operating on a specific route, in many cases there is actually no cooperation. There is not like an interlining arrangement between the two operators. Say that if one has an AOG, you can put the passengers on the other. You know, or if for whatever reason, operational reason, you are unable to operate, you can um, actually support each other. Those things are very rare in many of our operations today. And, and, and it always becomes difficult for me to understand. Why is that? Because these are very basic forms of cooperation. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's a bit like the plastic, uh, Raphael. You need to want to do it. But I must say, we have signed, uh, you know, agreements for in case of disruptions, you know, where you where you transfer automatically under agreed terms. Uh, Russia's, we have agreements for that. Uh, we have just signed some interline and code shares with South African operators. We have code shares with the, um, a few upper, further north operators, including Kenya, uh, Ethiopia. Uh, but yes, we need to do more. We need to, you know, give the passenger, the market, the option to, to fly at whatever time of the day, being it my flight or, or my partner flight, but we need to do more, sit at the table and leave there with the, you know, with the few uh, sectors that we need to start sharing. Uh, I agree with that. It's uh, our fault. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then bringing it down to uh, the AFRA level, I mean, AFRA has come up with a number of projects, projects and uh, products and solutions for member airlines to collaborate, to take advantage of. At least the one that is working very well <laughs> is the procurement program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But besides that, there's the a spare parts pooling program. And there, there's a network collaboration program among others. But we don't see um, same enthusiasm expressed by airlines to want to work together on, on the either the parts pooling or the, the network uh, collaboration. As chairman of the AFRA executive committee, uh, how can you help AFRA and AFRA members pull this together? Hmm. Look, we, we ourselves are just about to sign a, an agreement with another African op operator in terms of uh, spare parts pooling. Uh, but yes, we, we definitely need to make more noise about this uh, AFRA initiative. And it's not only a parts pooling. I see there is some repair opportunities uh, of some components. You know, there's no reason why you should stop brakes in all your outstations or even wheels. You know, if you have Kenya Airways or Ethiopian or LAM or, South, or Air Link or whoever, air, whichever airline member uh, can, can do. Uh, so yes, we need to make... More noise, and I tell you, the advantage is huge because you you save in stocking, you you increase the availability of parts, uh, and we've we've done that ad hoc, but it shouldn't be ad hoc. It should be planned. It should be you know all prepared to, to happen at the uh, switch of a button. Yeah, if I got, as Afra, we would we we would dedicate this year to make uh, quite a lot of noise among our members about the need for them to do this. Because they save them a lot of a lot of money and and make their operations much more efficient with very short ground times in case they have um, an AOG and and it's important um, if we start collaborating with baby steps this way then we might see the need to actually collaborate bigger big time especially on the commercial front in our operations. Yeah. Yes, indeed. But connectivity in Africa remains a major challenge. And uh, the Africa, um, the single Afghan air transport market has come in to sort of um, assist with the full implementation of the Yamasukro decision. But we have seen some back and forth movements. So far, some 35 countries have committed to the single Afghan air transport market. And about 18 of those have signed the memorandum of implementation. And uh, a further 10 of them have actually 
um, implemented all the concrete measures and are fully open in theory. Now, again, this, this boils down to cooperation and collaboration, but now at the state level, how can we fast track the implementation of the single Afghan air transport market? First, from the, the state perspective, because if the states open up, then airlines will have a free market to operate in. Mm -hmm. How do we engage with our governments to make sure that they, we, they all accede to a single Afghan air transport market? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I have been in this uh, theme since uh, Yamasukro 97, 90, I don't even remember when it started. It's more than 25 years ago. 30 years, actually, more than 30 years. Yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, and um, honestly, it's been a decision made and signed and enforced in a way, uh, not successfully, but uh, there was attempts to do that. But it was always very political. And, and I don't think it felt true uh, across the, the what what is needed. Because I can tell an example, in some countries, if you want to apply SATAM, you still have to go get uh, the, the BASA, the bilaterals changed because the bilaterals are designated carriers. Uh, and you know, if those designated carriers, of course, are between the two uh, countries, uh, op operators within the two countries, you have to have an FOP. I think SATAM should be SATAM, free airspace, uh, request the approval based on a slot available, go for it. Now, where I think the states need to, to make sure and, and give some assurance to the operators in general is not going to be turning into a price war, you know, where, where the airline doing the SATAM benefits, using benefits is going to kill the others and then increase the prices. That's, I think, the only assurance that states have to give, say, look, guys, it's not going to be this situation uh, because I don't think we want that to happen. But, but, uh, Communication is essential, political involvement, and our, you know, technical explanation as to what needs to be done. Please remove all the barriers. Don't, you say SATAM is there, but don't ask for an FOP, don't request for the buzz, or don't have the buzzers in place. The buzzer should be open. Once you have SATAM, why do you have, would you need a buzzer? Uh, mm -hmm. This is my point. And, and commitment. And I see AFCAC, AFRA are very strong about this and are, 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 doing all the lobbies required to make this happen. I understand that there is a group of four or five countries, I'm not sure, that are going to run an experimental uh, study or, or an implementation about this. It's something I just learned. I didn't read much about it, but maybe we as AFRA should start uh, spreading that uh, that word. And uh, yeah, like, uh, like you, we, we say, this will stimulate uh, inter-Africa flight uh, destinations. Yeah, in fact, on, on what you're saying, um, AFCAC actually launched uh, late last year what is called the Pilot Implementation Program, where they have um, identified a number of airlines in two clusters uh, to pilot the implementation and the focus to ensure that those two clusters completely open up their markets to each other. Uh, you know, which is a very laudable uh, initiative uh, by all means. The only thing for me is that if care is not taken, then these ones become like um, front runners and, and mm -hmm. others now trail behind. So for me, if I were in a country and I hear about the pilot implementation program, I will insist to be part of it as soon as possible and, yeah, and be yeah. one of the big ones so that I can take advantage of it. Now, the, the, the related to the single African air transport market is the Africa continental free trade area. And the worry for AFRA has always been that unless our airlines get stronger, unless our airlines work together, chances are we would not be the beneficiaries of the intra-Africa free trade movement when it gets into full gear because this will come with a lot of movement of cargo, a lot of movement of business people, but we need to organize ourselves to take advantage. And I, I thought the single African air transport market was a vehicle that could get us into that space. Now, we need 
a way of also working with the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, I know Afra is doing its bit, it's engaging with them and we're interfacing with them and as well as AFCAC. But is there something more we could do to ensure that there are no loose ends between what African airlines should be doing and what Africa continental free trade area should be doing going forward? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, I, I definitely think it's more commitment. We, we, we the past, like you said, I've, I had forgotten, it's almost 30 years now. Um, we haven't been committed. We haven't wanted to do, like I said, with the plastics. You know, we need to want to do it. Uh, we need to uh, take advantage of, uh, we've never had an AFCAC so committed to, or an institution, by the way, to, to stimulate this. Uh, and the good thing is AFCAC is involving Every, at every involved at every very high level, uh, so I would say that you know we need to to work together. Show us as technical uh, airline management, you know, as airline management. Sorry, to show the advantage of this, you know, how this will stimulate traffic. How in the future we will benefit from that, even if we're not directly flying the routes uh, now uh, by getting to hubs, getting from hubs. Uh, I think that's on our side commitment. The political side, I believe it's in the right track now. I, f I have that feeling. The pilot program is, I'm very keen to see what it's go how it's going to work. And I, I have the, the confidence that it's going to, to produce some good results. Great, great stuff. But, but as we speak, um, is LAM having any challenges getting traffic rights in any markets that you operate to or intend operating to? Yes, we are talking to a couple of uh, countries, of course, that's SATAM, that we want to have uh, traffic rights. And, and it is, I mean, actually, we've learned recently that's the position of one of those, uh, you know, that uh, we won't get uh, done. Uh, it's a pity because then we, it would be very convenient for us and we'll be able to offer a good product there. Again, without going into a price war, we would be committed to that. But let's see, we'll keep trying and we'll keep uh, looking at other uh, potential markets. Yeah, uh -oh, that, that's good. Um, and and uh, if there's any way that Afra can actually assist you, um, especially with en engaging with AFCAC so that we can engage with the states uh, to unlock the opportunities for your operations going forward, please do let us know as Afra. Thank you very much. Well, our, our time is almost up, but I cannot let you go without asking you um, the question about um, what legacy you want to leave behind as executive <laughs> committee chair of Afra and AZA. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure if it's a legacy I will, will want to leave. I mean, it's definitely as a, as a family. I mean, and this African Airlines is, is, uh, is like... Uh, the biggest value it has, you are a family. You know, I, my message is, yeah, join the aviation industry because you like it, uh, not for money, but because you like it and because you're committed to develop. But uh, more so is we need to start training and, and capacitating our youth. I am very confident that the next developments, the SATAM, all these things need to be addressed by fresh mind, you know, motivational uh, attitude, uh, cooperation uh, positions, you know, that I think the this youth that we have, if we train them well, and I've seen in, in I don't want to mention countries, but specifically, I've seen in a few countries where you train, you capacitate them, and they really go for it uh, to create a sustainable, um, uh, profitable, you know, and useful for the society uh, industry. Uh, I, I would think that, you know, we would need to introduce, and that's what I want to do, you know, in, in addition to capacitate the, the, or within capacitating the youth, is to introduce a, a safety culture, a culture of ethics, of uh, respect, of, uh, you know, uh, respect, uh, uh, considering the values that you have here, uh, and to, to uh, you know, uh, use as much as possible the 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 cooperation and you mentioned like spare parts pooling, uh, other types of pooling, interlining, office uh, sharing, you know, it, it, all kinds of um, of cooperation that can reduce your costs and that can increase your uh, your revenues. 
in a very short minute this was my is my my big message <laughs> oh thank you thank you so much um uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not too sure whether they, there's a uh, whether we have a problem with our our system today. Um, I cannot even actually see the list of attendants um, on today's program. It's not coming up. So as a result, I'm not also seeing any questions or comments. Uh, can the our technicians uh, just confirm that we don't have any questions before we close. Uh, we are almost um, overshooting our time by a minute. But I, I, I don't see any. So I would want us to wrap up our discussions here. Uh, so on behalf of all the delegates who have joined us today, on behalf of African Airlines Association, I would want to sincerely thank our guest today, Mr. Joao, for the taking time of his busy schedule to spend this one hour with us, enlightening us about the African aviation industry and uh, the many, many things that we can do together. Uh, in particular, uh, he has indicated his passion uh, during the rest of his time in this industry to ensure that he brings up as many youth as possible into the industry uh, so that they can take off from us and grow the business to where it ought to be. He wants also to see a safety culture. He wants to see this industry uh, grow to become what we want it to be, embracing safety in all its facets. And uh, thirdly, you would want to also see cooperation among airlines, among entities in this industry, so that together African aviation would grow bigger and better and be able to support our continents. On that note, I want to thank you, Mr. Joao, for your time today and to thank our guests for the opportunity uh, to join us today at this um, session of Afra Sky Connect. Until we meet again next month on the 5th of April, 2023, I wish to thank all of you for participating and to thank our guests for being with us today. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you Rafael. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.